Several weeks ago, we uh, began our newest semester of Monday Night Live. Uh, if you're not familiar, or if you haven't been through it, I, I highly recommend it. It's a great opportunity to learn how to share your faith with others. But uh, when we go out visiting, uh, teams quite often uh, need or ask for a list of Sunday school classes. So when they visit people who haven't been to Bible school here, uh, Bible school, Bible study here before, uh, they can recommend a class. And so uh, being how I'm responsible for the adult education, I set about uh, listing all the classes with a, a brief description of the class. And, and what better person to rely on than the teacher? So I contacted all my teachers and asked them to give me, Barry, you need to move over here. I can't stand you being on the wrong side of the... <laughs> this is killing me. <laughs> this is a Baptist church, boy. <clears throat> So, so I ask all the teachers, I'm going to look this way, I, I ask all the teachers to give me a description of their class uh, so that, uh, you know, the general age bracket, ours, by the way, is 2 to 102, in case you wondered, um, and so that I could uh, put descriptions together. Uh, and I was kind of interested in the number of descriptions that came back and said, blah, 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 an in-depth Bible study. An in and there were several classes that said an in-depth Bible study. I thought, well, how interesting. Uh, and just wondered if perhaps for this class, I ought just should put maybe a shallow and superficial run through the scriptures. Uh, <clears throat> I, of course we want to have an in-depth Bible study, but I thought, what is that? Uh, because I had always thought that kind of what we were doing verse by verse through the entire Bible was pretty much an in-depth Bible study. Uh, and then I ran headlong into this week's lesson. Had it all prepared, in the can, as they say, ready to go. Uh, and God did one of those, you know, talk to the hand things and said, stop. Let's talk about this thing. Uh, and even as I did my prep, I, I, I read, uh, and I love to read through my um, uh, Charles Haddon Spurgeon's comments on the Psalms. Um, I realized that I was going in the wrong direction. And so I'm going to do something today that I just never do, just never do. Uh, and I'll tell you what kind of got me thinking about that. Um, I'm going through a lot of our old family pictures, portraits, such as that, and digitizing them. Uh, and I've got a, a picture of my mother-in-law, Hazel, uh, at her wedding. Beautiful picture, beautiful picture, just a few years ago. Uh, but the picture's been around for a while, and it got creased somehow. And so when you scan it, you still see a line across there with the crease. So no problem. I got out Photoshop to fix it. And I don't know if you've ever worked with Photoshop to, or if you know the, the procedures, you know how it works. But uh, uh, I'm able to magnify the picture, keep magnifying it and magnifying it till, till I get down to the pixel level actually. Hey, Brad can help me here when I go off, to run it in the ditch, you can tell me where I'm wrong here, but I've got the thing all magnified up, and, and I can actually, you know, change or heal, use the healing tool or the brush tool or whatever, and, and blend it in with the surrounding areas and take that little crease out of there. And when I was down there looking at that, it's hard to remember that this big, the entire page was one fold of a wedding dress. And so if I just showed you, you know, if Karen had come in and asked me what I was working on, she'd have had no idea because there's just a page of white with some little swirls running through it. And in order to see what's really going on, I had to back way off. Sometimes scripture's like that. And it's great to do an in-depth look. Let's, let's go down to the etymology of the, of the, the scripture, uh, the his, historical setting, uh, the biblical background. All those things are wonderful. But at times, I really think you've got to step back and look at the beauty of the Scripture the way God gave it to us. Because sometimes you've heard you don't see the forest for the trees. Uh, if you get too dialed in to detail. And as I looked at, at Psalm 61 and 62, which is our lesson for today, I realized I'm looking the wrong way. God gave us Psalms 61 through 64. I think... As a group, they're relatively brief, but there is a, a beautiful lesson in Psalm 61 through 64 that you miss if you get all hung up in it. 
So here's what I'm going to do today. I'm going to give you brief introductions to each one of the Psalms, and I will probably stop on occasion just to kind of highlight an area that I think needs to be highlighted. But for the most part, I'd kind of like to just go through them pretty quickly at a view of from 10,000 feet, and I think you'll see some things you wouldn't see had we delved into it very deeply and taken two weeks to do it. Okay? This means okay. Okay. Psalm 61. Please join me there. The superscription says, For the director of music with stringed instruments of David. So we know the author. We know that it's meant to be sung. It's meant to be accompanied by stringed instruments. Uh, uh, by one of the, of the several uh, musical directors that he had. And I just want to give you a little background because this is what's important <clears throat> to all four psalms. The best we can tell, uh, this psalm was, was written by David when he was running from his son Absalom. Absalom had fostered a, a, a revolt in the kingdom. Uh, he was running to get away from him, hiding in the mountains. Okay? Join me there. Hear my cry, O God. Listen to my prayer. From the ends of the earth I call to you. I call as my heart grows faint. Lead me to the rock that is higher than I, for you have been my refuge, a strong tower against the foe. I long to dwell in your tent forever and take refuge in the shelter of your wings. Selah. Selah means break. Let's break. For you have heard my vows, O God. You have given me the heritage of those who fear your name. I want to stop right here because what's about to happen is a literary device that was really quite common in Hebrew literature. It's not very common in English. So this throws you some time. And he is changing persons. He's changing to the, to the third person when he says, Increase the days of the king's life. Who's the king? He is. He could well have said, today we would have said increase the days of my life, but I, I don't want you to miss the fact. I have heard it even preached that perhaps this is one of the messianic references to be found in the Old Testament. Listen, as happy as I am to find messianic references in the Old Testament, I don't think this is one of them. I think he's talking about himself. Why would he ask God to increase his own life? Don't think that's necessary. Increase the days of the king's life. His years for many generations, may he be enthroned in God's presence forever. Is he already enthroned? Yes, he is. Where does the king wish to be enthroned? In God's presence. Appoint your love and faithfulness to protect him. Then will, now he's shifting, he's shifting persons again. Then will I ever sing praise to your name and fulfill my vows day after day. The 62nd Psalm is a completely different place and time. It is likely from the wording here, and we'll get there in a minute, that he wrote this in his dotage, in his old age. Okay? Um, likely at the time of Sheba's rebellion. Uh, Sheba was a Benjaminite. Does anybody know why that's significant? Let me tell you who else was a Benjaminite. Saul was a Benjaminite. And you know that there was tension, obviously, between David's house and Saul's house. None on David's part, mainly on Saul's. So these were relative, these were kin, kin of Saul who wanted David, you know, out of his position and fostered a rebellion near the end of his life. So kind of bear in mind that he's an older man and he's facing a difficult time with the rebellion in the kingdom. This is also for the director of music, for Jejuthun, who was one of the uh, directors of music, by the way, his name is mentioned in two or three of the other psalms written by David, a psalm of David. My soul finds rest in God alone. My salvation comes from Him. He alone is my rock and my salvation. He is my fortress. I will never be shaken. Do you start to see already a parallel with the first psalm? Who is His rock? Who is His fortress? How long will you assault a man? Now, he's obviously not talking to God now, okay? Once again, he's kind of shifting something we don't normally do in 21st century literature, but he's shifting, and he's speaking to those who persecute him. He's, he's speaking to Sheba and his followers. How long will you assault a man? Would all of you throw him down this leaning wall, this tottering fence? 
Anybody ever had a tottering fence? I was at my friend Jimmy Hausenflukes not too long ago, and a big old wind came through, and the fence, some of the fence posts were a little rotten, and it started blowing the fence over, and when, when it, they broke off toward the ground, what happened when one of them fell? It just, just like dominoes, they started falling, but it's, it, you get the picture of a tottering fence. He's talking about the fact that he's not well. He's not healthy. He's probably in, in his old age. He says, this leaning wall, this tottering fence, they fully intend to topple him from his lofty place. They take delight in lies. With their mouths they bless, but in their hearts they curse. Selah. You find this a lot in the Davidic literature. And one thing that, that I find very interesting is the biblical concept that one of the most fierce, one of the most destructive weapons of all is the tongue. There were armies, there were swords after him, yes. But what does he write about quite often? Tongues. That was Absalom's greatest weapon, by the way. When Absalom began his rebellion, he sat outside the city gate and just glad-handed people and told them how great he was and what a rotten guy his father was. So the gossip, the tongue, was what was really on his mind right now because he says, you know what? With their mouths they bless me, but in their hearts they curse Find rest, O my soul, in God alone. My hope comes from Him. He alone is my rock and my salvation. He is my fortress. I will not be shaken. My salvation and my honor depend on God. He is my mighty rock, my refuge. Trust in Him at all times, O my people. Pour out your hearts to Him, for God is our refuge. Selah. Now, he's, he has praised God, he has thanked God for being his refuge, and he's going to pause right now, and when, when he starts up, uh, he's going to start up with a truth, with a didactic teaching. Low-born men are but a breath, high-born are but a lie. But if weighed on a balance, they are nothing, together they're only a breath. This is almost Proverbs. Uh, if you remember, the, if you've read the wisdom of Proverbs, Saul is kind of... Uh, uh, Sol I'm sorry, David now is kind of waxing eloquently here about the state of life. He says, it doesn't matter if you were born rich or if you are born poor, it's going to be over pretty quickly. Life is but a breath. Do not trust in extortion or take pride in stolen goods, though your riches increase. Do not set your heart on them. He's offering some wisdom, I think, I believe, to the people who are persecuting him to the people who are after him. Uh, and apparently there's a little larceny on their hearts besides uh, just the fact that they're speaking bad about him. Okay? So he says, look, don't do that. Don't steal. You might be rich, but it's not going to be good for you in the long run. Because listen to what he says. One thing God has spoken, two things I have heard. Now, I wasn't going to get down into minutia, but I just can't help myself. Uh, this is a literary figure that happens in Hebrew literature that we don't see much here. But when, when you see it in the Bible, and you do quite frequently in the Old Testament, when he says, one thing is this, a second thing is this, it's done for emphasis. That, that's what he's, what he's doing. He says, I want you to pay special attention. So one thing God has spoken, two things I've heard, that you, O oh God, are strong, and you, O oh God, are loving, Surely you will reward each person according to what he has done. This is not works theology. Don't get all excited about the fact that he said you'll reward him according to what he's done. Because we do know that apparently from Scripture there are degrees of reward in heaven. And apparently degrees of punishment in hell. But this is not your salvation according to what you've done. But it is very scriptural to say you will be rewarded according to that. The, the 63rd Psalm. Who wrote it? David. It doesn't tell us that it was for the director of music or that it's meant to be sung, although it was because 61 through 64 were sung sometimes as a unit. But we've got a completely different place and a completely different time. Now, once again, apparently this is when he was on the run. I'm going to tell you it's from Absalom. Some people say it was from Saul, but I'm going to tell you later why I think it's from Absalom. I believe he's still on the run from Absalom. And rather than in the mountains, like we heard from him before, now he's out in the desert in Judah, a very dry and desolate place. And in the midst of, of the dry and desolate place, what does he say? Oh God, you are my God. 
earnestly I seek you. And in the desert, what metaphor does he use? My soul thirsts for you. My body longs for you in a dry and weary land where there is no water. I've seen you in the sanctuary and beheld your power and your glory because your love is better than life. My lips will glorify you. I will praise you as long as I live. And in your name, I will lift up my hands. My soul will be satisfied as with the richest of foods. With singing lips, my mouth will praise you. I just have to stop for a minute because he has just painted a beautiful word picture. And I want you to think about what he said. Have you ever been thirsty? Really thirsty? Thinking you're going to die thirsty? I haven't been there. I've been really thirsty till my lips cracked and my mouth was just, have you, have you ever been where you couldn't spit? That's thirsty. I, I've been there. I've gotten away from water and I, you know, I was just looking for any body of water. I don't care what it was to get a drink out of. You can just get desperate for something. And I love the picture that he paints because for what or whom is he desperate? God, doesn't that fit in with Dan's message today? Oh, my goodness. And, and we've already been through this, but as a deer panteth for the water, so my soul longs after you. That's David saying, you know what? My soul thirsts for you. My body longs for you because your love is better than life. I like the picture that he paints here about, you know what? My soul will be satisfied as with the richest of food. There's nothing I could, I could taste, nothing I could put in my mouth that would be any sweeter than fellowship with you, Lord. Look what he says. On my bed I remember you. I think of you through the watches of the night because you are my help. He said, 24-7, all day long, whether I'm going to bed at night during the day, you are on my mind. I will sing in the shadows of your wings. My soul clings to you. Your right hand upholds me. They who seek my life will be destroyed. They will go down to the depths of the earth. They will be given over to the sword and become food for jackals. But the king, we're going third person again, okay, speaking of himself, I will rejoice in God. All who swear by God's name will praise him while the mouths of liars will be silenced. This is not an imprecatory prayer. He's not praying that God destroyed them, but what is he saying about the final fate of those who are trying to, to, trying to take him down? They'll be destroyed one way or the other. One way or the other. Will, will, they, will they be destroyed militarily or, or you know, by the police right now? Not necessarily. Sometimes the bad guys win in this life. But David's got a longer-term perspective. The mouths of liars will be silenced. Psalm 64, meant to be sung for the director of music. It is of David. We are switching places again, but we are back to Sheba's rebellion. This is something he's talking about while there is a conspiracy against him. Hear me, O God, as I voice my complaint. Protect my life from the threat of the enemy. Hide me from the conspiracy of the wicked, from that noisy crowd of evildoers. What's their main weapon? They sharpen their tongues like swords and aim their words like deadly arrows. They shoot from ambush at the innocent man. They shoot at him suddenly without fear. In other words, he's kind of amazed at how bold they are. He's the king and yet they're firing arrows of slander at him. They encourage each other in evil plans. They talk about hiding their snares. They say, who will see them? Remember, we talked about that last week. In essence, what he's saying is, they think you don't see that, God. That's what he's saying. They plot injustice and say, we have devised a perfect plan. Surely the mind and heart of man are cunning, but how will they be rewarded? God will shoot them with arrows. Suddenly they will be struck down. Don't get hung up in the idea that David is saying that his foes are going to be literally shot through with arrows. He's just used the example of words like arrows. So he says, you know what? They, they lofted a few arrows at us. God's going to loft some back. They may be physical errors. 
arrows. They may be illness. They may be any number of different things. But look what he says. The vengeance is the Lord's. He will turn their own tongues against them and bring them to ruin. All who see them will shake their heads in scorn. All mankind will fear they will proclaim the works of God and ponder what he has done. Let the righteous rejoice in the Lord and take refuge in him. Let all the upright in heart praise him. Monday is one of my, it's my long day, my, the longest day of the week normally for me. But it's a, a fascinating day to me. Because I generally begin at the gym at 5.30, then I'm, I'm here early, and, and one of the first things that happen is that the Parents' Day Out kids come in, which I love. Now, their parents sometimes aren't too excited to see me because they're still in their pajamas, you know, and they're bringing the kids up here. But, uh, uh, but I love seeing the kids, and I know a lot of them by name. And, uh, you know, we've had this infestation of little crickets and little beetles that are everywhere, and you can't get rid of them. And, and so Rosalinda and I pick up the, the beetles and the, and the crickets before the kids get it. But it never fails. There will be one in the hall, and every little kid who comes in goes, <laughs> you know. They can't miss the bug. But I love them. And, and I get to, get to visit with all the little kids, um, get to pray with the workers b- before the, the first of the day. And uh, shortly after that's done, then I go to Encore Voices. You know what that is? That's Senior Adult Choir. From the sublime to the ridiculous, as it, as it <laughs> might be. And then as soon as that's done, we run into lunch that we serve for the Southwestern University students. Um, so I get to go and sit with the college students and visit with them. And about the time we're done with the dishes there, then it's time to go to Encore Evangelism. So we go out visiting and get to many. I see many of you are here today that we, we visited in your homes. Uh, then when that's done, I get to come back and share a time of fellowship with the broader congregation uh, as we have uh, Monday Night Live, uh, share a meal, and go out for visitation. So I pretty well run the spectrum of people back and forth but I still think my favorite times with the little kids and something happened a couple weeks back that really stuck with me and that most of the little ones will see me and say hi Pastor Jack and and wave at me Uh, I've gotten their trust and there's one little boy that always says hello to me Bullock's grandchild you know little Ian and he always says hi but when Jana came to get him the other day you know he was kind of walking as much as he can and so I came running up and says, Ian, good to see you. I'm glad you, hope you had fun today. And immediately he got down behind her legs and underneath her legs looked up at me <laughs> like, ooh, who's this, this big loud guy here, you know? And I thought, Ian, man, you're my buddy. Why, why are you, you hiding? And I looked at the picture and you got to get the perspective of a little kid who's down here between his parents' legs. And what does he think when he's behind there? I'm safe. I'm safe. And I thought, what an interesting picture. What an interesting picture. Because uh, uh, I was going to say I'm bigger than Jana, but i got to tell you, I'm I'm a lot bigger than Jana physically, but you never want to get between a mom and her babies, believe me. But but I think he doesn't know that I'm bigger than Jana. All he knows is that he's safe. And as I look at Psalms 61 through 64, I get that same picture. That David, a man after God's own heart, has found a safe place. That might not seem big to you, but let me tell you why it seems huge to me. First is that he's a man. You know, the men are out there looking at, you know, looking at me like, don't go there. Don't you go there. (laughs) But the fact is, we like to think we can take care of ourselves, often to our detriment. Um, that's why we don't ask for directions, by the way. Um, but men are supposed to be the protectors, not the protected, right? Uh, David was no different. He had great physical prowess, good grief. He, he killed Goliath. He was a great warrior. And he was the king. The king. So if anybody didn't need protecting or didn't think he needed protecting, it would have to be David. But there is that vulnerability. When you finally come to the time that you realize that 
you can't do it? Listen, I've seen grown men with their mamas. You want your protector. Uh, last week, I got to go visit Lamar Seals. You probably don't know Lamar Seals, but he's a University of Mary Harden Baylor football player who completely destroyed his knee. Uh, and he's uh, 6'1", about 265 defensive lineman. Uh, and as I saw him in that bed, he was just dying with frustration uh, that, that he finally realized he's human that he could break. Hey, he's 19 years old, you know. He's preseason All-American defensive tackle, and there he is in a bed, and he can't walk. It's kind of interesting to see when you're humble like that uh, what your reaction is, and he's an incredible young man and didn't let it get him down because he says, you know what, God's got plans for me. He's an academic All-American too, by the way. So, I look at how he faced that and thought, what it must have been like for David to say, I need you, Lord. How should we react to this? Was it a foxhole conversion? Would David just get himself in a bind and say, Lord, help me out here? That's why I wanted to read all four Psalms, because what you have is a panorama of David's life and times at his life in which he found himself under persecution. And what's one thing that was in common with all four instances? He turned to God as his rock and his fortress in those times. I think that's a pretty good lesson to learn. And I hope that's not Sunday school light. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word. I want to thank you for the example of a man who was a king and a mighty warrior and yet didn't hesitate uh, to strip himself bare of all that and say that he needed you. You indeed, Father, are our rock and our fortress. And we thank you that you are a place in which we can find shelter. Uh, you are dependable. And Father, as we uh, go our separate ways today, help us to remember that. Help us also to remember that we are people sharing Jesus. For we do it in the name of your Son. Amen.